Hello and welcome. My name is Jeremy Glover and it's my pleasure to introduce our latest Fenwick Elliott webinar. This week we're turning to the question of contract payment mechanisms and I'm really pleased to be introducing as our speakers two of our senior associates, Rebecca Arda and Adele Parsons. And they'll be considering some of the latest developments revolving around payment mechanisms, including the CC construction case. And they'll be looking at statutory contractual logistics and deadlines, looking at how to, to avoid being caught out of pocket, both in respect of interim payments and final accounts. And also asking how, if at all, the final statements could be challenged. I know from working with both Rebecca and Adele that they're the perfect people to be talking about these, the, these issues. Not, not least because these are just the typical type of issues that they both look at on a regular basis. So just a quick reminder about logistics, you are all on mute. Please do send me any questions and you'll be able to find the slides on our website later in the week. Hopefully we will be putting a link in um, in the chat during the webinar. But let's move straight on and over to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you for coming, everyone. I'm Rebecca Arda and I'm joined by my colleague Adele Parsons and today we are going to be discussing contract payment mechanisms. I know it may not be the most exciting area of construction or of construction law, which is obviously hugely exciting in, in all other cases, but it is arguably the most important, which I know you'll realise as you're all here, so I don't have to sell it to you, but there is a general tendency to be complacent when it comes to payment mechanisms. Um, hopefully at the end of today, We'll all be well aware that attention to detail, timeliness and due process requires strict monitoring during any project and by those looking to enforce the terms. So today we are off on an adventure through the statutory and contractual interim payment mechanisms. We'll focus a little bit more on the nuances of each of these and some practical tips and then we'll move into the final account mechanisms before looking more closely at the JCT final statement procedure in particular. So the statutory mechanisms. The Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act 1996, or Construction Act, sets out the statutory payment mechanisms at sections 109 through 113. This statutory mechanism is then supplemented by the Scheme for Construction Contracts, England and Wales, Regulations 1998, affectionately known as the Scheme. So sections 109 through 113 essentially point out that a contract needs to provide for interim payments on a regular basis, provide a basis for determining what and when payments become due in the intervals for these. This generally requires a timetable, provision for the relevant notices, which are applications in some cases, payment notices, default payment notices and pay less notices, as well as the due dates and final dates for payment. Where these provisions are either missing, inadequate, or do not comply with the Construction Act, then the scheme will apply. This is the case even where the parties consider there to be legitimate contractual payment mechanisms. The statutory mechanisms will always be an implied term to the extent they are needed. So while you can run, possibly even hide, you cannot escape the statutory mechanism. You should always be aware of the requirements of the Construction Act and of the scheme even when negotiating and implementing what appears on the outside to be an isolated contractual mechanism. In the case of absolutely no contractual mechanism or an entirely non-compliant contractual mechanism, the scheme will be implied in its entirety. In other cases where there is an entirely compliant contractual mechanism, then the scheme will not apply at all. However, it was held in Bennett Construction and CIMC that the scheme can be incorporated in a piecemeal matter being applied only to the extent required to fill the necessary gaps. So there can therefore be a hybrid kind of situation between a contractual payment mechanism and the statutory mechanism to the extent that this is needed. Section 109.1 of the Construction Act gives the parties the right to implement staged payments for work performed under a contract, provided the work is to be more than 45 days in duration. There is a large amount of freedom within this when it comes to these stages or instalments, with the only real limitation being through section 110, which requires that the payment mechanism is adequate. For compliance with section 109, it is important to be as clear and unambiguous as possible with the terms used, so as clear dates and circumstances for payments being due are identifiable. <clears throat> 
In Rushford Construction, it was found that a contract with terms such as application date, end of month, valuations monthly, and payment terms 30 days from invoice were unclear and ambiguous and therefore did not comply with the Construction Act. Accordingly, the scheme was implied to the extent that a due date and a final date for payment were incorporated. So to this end, it is important to at least specify the dates on which these events are to fall, for example, the 25th of the month as opposed to monthly. Where there is an error in the mechanism, however, the court has slightly more leeway to take a pragmatic approach to interpreting that schedule, especially where this error is clear and obvious. In terms of the length of the payment mechanism, particular attention should be paid to this by all parties. Generally, the stage payments are specific to the lifetime of the contract. Sometimes contracts will set these out in payment schedules that mimic a calendar from the commencement of the project to its completion, with the final period for payment being when the contract was originally projected to end. There had previously been some debate as to whether this period following the expiration of the payment cycle was technically a contract operating without a payment mechanism, therefore allowing the scheme to take over. Essentially, whether it could be approached on a contract of two halves sort of basis. According to Balfour Beatty, however, this is not the case. In order to be adequate under Section 110, a contractual mechanism must comply with Section 109. Here it was held that a mechanism need only provide details as to the amounts and dates or circumstances of payment for any of the works in order to comply with Section 109. It need not provide these for all of the works. Therefore, if a mechanism ends, the right to interim payment ceases and a contractor has no further recourse until the assessment of the final account. In Balfour Beatty, the Court of Appeal found that there was no express or implied term providing that monthly interim payments continued after the payment schedule had expired. The contract complied with Section 109, therefore the provisions of the scheme had not been implied and there was no fresh contract for monthly interim payments after the payment schedule expired. This was, they said, a classic case of a party making a bad bargain. So this is something that payees in particular need to be particularly vigilant of and look to ensure that where a contract has exceeded its original duration, the payment schedule is updated to carry through to the new expected end of the works. This is something that can be negotiated throughout the lifetime of the contract and as long as, as was said in Balfour Beatty, there is a fresh contract for these terms, then it shall be deemed to apply. On the alternative, however, the payer should be also vigilant of any end dates of existing mechanisms. It may be that they wish instead to rely on the provisions of Balfour Beatty and make no further payments until such time as the final account. In this case, responding to any further applications or valuations with their own notice or certification could be deemed to be acceptance of a fresh contract for interim payments and then prevent them from relying on this principle in the future. To avoid all of this in its entirety, as discussed, it is probably better to refer to specific dates, but unspecified months or durations when negotiating a contract. So, for example, not having such a calendar style schedule, but rather a provision that these cycles are to occur, say, on the 25th of each month, and then days, numbered days, 7, 5, 17, for example, thereafter, as opposed to having dates for each month throughout calendar years that obviously will have a finite end date. Um, it seems rather ironic now, after having just lectured on clarity and specificity, to turn to section 110 and the confusion that surrounds the vague use of adequate um, in that section. Unfortunately, there have only been a handful of times that this question of an adequate mechanism has been before the courts. The general consensus seems to be that the use of the word adequate is simply to encourage transparent and easily understandable mechanisms. So generally, if a mechanism complies with, one se with section 109 and it is clear, then it is likely to be adequate for the purpose of section 110. The biggest concerns in section 110 are the due date for payment and the final date for payment. The parties have flexibility to agree amongst themselves the length of time between the due date and final date for payment, with the final date for payment being the absolute key. If this date passes without a payment being made or a payless notice being issued, the contractor will immediately have recourse under the Construction Act 
being the right to either suspend performance of its obligations under the construction contract or to refer the dispute to adjudication. In terms of the timeline between these uh, payment dates, the scheme suggests based on a 28 day payment cycle starting from the commencement of the contract that a payment shall become due on either the expiration of seven days following the relevant period or the making of a claim by the payee with the final date for payment being 17 days from the date that the payment becomes due. Obviously, as I say, so long as there is an adequate and compliant mechanism within the contract, these specific times are flexible and up to the agreement of the parties. In terms of conditional payments, Section 110.1a prevents an adequate mechanism from linking to payment obligations under another contract. Therefore, pay when paid situations are specifically prohibited. In order to still maintain some level of security in relation to money in versus money out, a payer could look instead to extend the time allowed for payment under Section 110.1 to allow more time for the payer to pursue payments up the line. There are limited circumstances in which conditional payment provisions will be permissible under Section 110 which include when a payment has not been received due to insolvency up the line, for example, or in limited management contracting situations. Excuse me. <laughs> payment notices and default payment notices. Section 110A1 requires that a payment notice be given not later than five days after the payment due date. They must be made in time and set out the sum due at the payment due date and the basis on which that sum was calculated. Notices must be given, even where the sum due is zero. I cannot tell you how frequently I come across payment notices that do not set out the sum due to be paid. Please make this clear. Do not rely on stating the value of the works or count on someone else taking their value and deducting the amount already paid to reach the sum due. You must do this math for them and set it out very clearly. Please also supplement this with any specific rules or requirements of your particular construction contract. <coughs> Excuse me. If it requires your notice to be on blue paper, you will use the blue paper. If the paying party fails to give a payment notice, the contractor's application for payment, if any, will become a default payment notice and the sum due must be, date on the, must be paid on the final date for payment unless a payless notice is given in time. All three of these notices, according to Coulson J as he was then, and Grove Developments ought to take the same form. <coughs> Excuse me. In particular, as is becoming common theme, these should be clear, unambiguous, and have their intention to be a payment application or notice made clear by the covering email or letter that accompanies it. I would take this further and recommend that the covering email or letter also restate the sum due, just for certainty. In terms of default paying payment notices, a contractor or unpaid party should serve one only if it had not served a payment application and the paying party fails to give a payment notice. <clears throat> it is worth noting that the final date for payment is adjusted to reflect the date of the default notice, rather than remaining the final date for payment. Excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> rather than remaining the final date for payment associated with the original application. <clears throat> Accordingly, contractors should serve these at the earliest opportunity to ensure any delay to payment is minimal. <coughs> Sorry, I think it might be best if Adele now moves to the final account mechanisms, and then we can come back in time for payment, pay less notices. Yeah, of course, that's fine. Okay, so let's run through, give Bex voice a little break. So um, leading on from what Rebecca's dealt with so far and her helpful run for as regard the Act and interim payments, what I wanted to do today was take some time to discuss the final account mechanisms 
um, as there's quite a few practical points and thus potential pitfalls to consider in terms of contents, supporting information, notices, deadlines and conclusivity provisions amongst others, which can make this area really quite adversarial, costly and time consuming, particularly given that the contents of final certificates or final statements, as in the case of the JCT, can become conclusive and binding in a relatively short period of time if not challenged correctly. So what does the, um, the Construction Act say about final account mechanisms? For example, for all the hassle they can cause parties and the disputes that arise, are they actually needed for there to be an adequate payment mechanism as required by the Construction Act? Now, as a quick refresher and as what Rebecca's touched upon, the Construction Act requires that construction contracts contain an adequate payment mechanism that determines what payment becomes due under the contract and when. Um, and this whole process is very much focused on interim payment mechanisms. There's no specific requirement under the Construction Act for there to be a final account mechanism. Confusingly, however, the scheme for construction contract regulations 1998, which I'll refer to as just the scheme hereafter, does contain a final account provision which can be implied into a construction contract. So this then raises the question, what happens if a contract only includes an interim payment mechanism and not a separate final account mechanism? For example, does the final account provision stated in the scheme have to be implied into the contract? Similarly, is there an argument that a party is not entitled to issue a final account or application if there's nothing in the contract on this? Now, this was addressed um, in the case that you can see on the slide of JSN Construction versus Western Power. To summarise the facts, Western Power engaged JSN to install two um, rather large cables and associated ductwork in Birmingham. The contract price was approximately four million and uh, the contract included provisions in respect of prices and rates for additional works and extra materials. Uh, it also stated that Western Power was to ascertain and determine the value of the works. Now, after the works were completed, JSM issued what it referred to as its final application for payment. And this was for approximately 1.5 million, which brought its total gross value for the works and variation and damages and the like to just over 5.5 million. No payment was made, so JSM commenced proceedings. Now, in response to this, Western Power applied to strike out the claim or enter summary judgment on the basis that there was no claim, as there was no final account provision under the contract, and the contract only provided for interim payments. The issue for the court, therefore, was whether the contract should have a final payment mechanism, and whether that mechanism should be the one set out within the scheme, i.e. by way of it being implied into the contract by the Construction Act, or was JSM entitled to make its final application in the manner that it did, in lieu of there being no final account provision? In summary, and helpfully for JSM, uh, Mr Justice Pepperell dismissed Western Power's claim to strike out and enter summary judgment, as he found that the threshold question is whether the contract provides an adequate mechanism for determining what payments become due under the contract and when. If it does, then there's no question of implying default terms under the scheme. There's nothing in the Construction Act which necessarily requires parties to make a separate provision for a final account. Therefore, although the scheme does contain a final account provision, that does not mean a final account process is required under the Construction Act. The court did note, however, that the question of whether there is an adequate mechanism was ultimately a question of fact, not law, such that the issue could only be properly determined at trial. Now, <clears throat> as to the practical implications of this, um, and as the court acknowledges, it is a question of fact in each case whether a construction contract has an adequate mechanism for payment. If a construction contract does not contain a final account mechanism, I don't think this results in there being less work for the contractor or their QS, as there's arguably more pressure to produce accurate and fully up-to-date valuations as the work progresses, which in turn have to follow a prescribed valuation method, which is agreed at the outset. And there's certainly a benefit to this approach rather than the throw everything at them, kitchen sink approach that can tend to arise in preparing final accounts. And certainly when it comes to disputing them as a result of a party retrospectively valuing claims as opposed to assessing them on a contem contemporaneous basis. 
And I think it's this interim approach and its logistical advantages that were on the minds of the NEC draftsmen when they drafted NEC3. So as to give a whistle-stop tour of these suites, and as a reminder, as quite frankly, the entire final account topic could be discussed all afternoon um, and then some more, um, I just wanted to flag um, sort of the, the key provisions within the suites. Um, and in particular, that the standard NEC has no express final account mechanism, only provisions for interim payments within the contract. Now, however, in practice, parties do seem to introduce their own bespoke final account provisions by way of Z clauses in any event. Um, and that certainly seems that this was one of the factors that have led to NEC introducing a final account mechanism or what it refers to as a final assessment within the NEC 4. Now, the NEC 4, um, the final assessment process is set out in clause 53 of the NEC 4 engineering and construction contract in this instance. While the provisions are less detailed than the final statement provisions within the JCT contracts, which I'll come to, there are still some points to note in terms of deadlines, conclusivity and not being caught short. Um, the first of these is that the project manager carries out an assessment of the final amount due and certifies a final payment, providing the contractor with details of how the amount due has been assessed no later than four weeks after the defect certificate or 13 weeks after a termination certificate, if that's the case. Final payment is then to be made within three weeks of that assessment, of course, unless a different period is stated in the contract data. So this is a point to, to check. Um, we'll come back to you basically needing to check the contract as a, as a general theme throughout this talk, I think. Um, if the project manager fails to carry out that assessment within the required time scale, the contractor may issue its own assessment to the client. So this is also another deadline to be mindful of. Um, if the client accepts the contractor's assessment, then final payment is made within two weeks. Again, unless a different pay, pay period is stated in the contract data. Importantly, and similar in some respects to the JCT final statement, which I discussed shortly, a contractually valid final assessment submitted within the per permitted time limits can become conclusive evidence as to the final account due under or in connection with the contract, unless a party challenges it in accordance with clause 53. Um, and those challenges differ, actually, depending on which optional W clause um, applies to the contract. So again, this is another thing that needs to be checked. Now, the NEC can be contrasted with the JCT suite, which is a lot more prescriptive than the NEC, but which I think also acts as a useful reminder for certain points to be made aware of, um, irrespective of the type of contract you're working with. So, you know, there's some useful guidelines that, that come out of this, even though we're using the JCT as an example. So, looking at the JCT, one point to note is that the Final account provisions do change in terms of timings, contents, and logistics, depending on which JCT contract you're working with. However, there are general themes running across the suite, and I think more generally across a lot of contracts that you should be aware of. Now, the first of these uh, to be aware of is content. For example, in respect of the JCT, uh, the final statement must show the contract sum is adjusted, the sums of amounts already paid to date and the balance due to the contractor um, or the employer, as the case may be. Of course, what sits within a final account is a matter for the contract and will vary depending on the project. However, in practical terms, you should consider your final account to be essentially the last word in that it's a consolidated final summary of all the works completed to date and a submission as to all the contractor's valid contractual claims for additional payment. Um, and this will include not exclusively uh, variations, claims for loss and expense, uh, EOTs, LADs as the case may be, provisional sums, retention. Um, you may also need to address any contra charges that have been imposed along the way. Also check whether you're required to provide supporting documentation. I mean, this is certainly a requirement under the JCT, but check the extent of the information that's required. For example, are you required to provide all supporting information or what the employer may only reasonably require, which I appreciate is still likely to be a lot of information. 
from a practical perspective, try not to leave any gaps and figures unsubstantiated. An important part of the contractor's or its quantity surveyor's work will be to try to reach agreement of the final account with the employer. And the best approach in this regard is for the parties to assist each other to understand what is properly due under the terms of the contract. This also avoids any nasty surprises and hopefully the need to challenge a final statement or a final, a final certificate. Um, by way of example, I've been working on a case recently where the difference between the parties' valuations of the final contract sum jumped from a forecasted 89,000 to um, a rather staggering 1.3 million when the employer ambushed the contractor with a, with a purported final statement. Um, that statement was not substantiated or explained and understandably was a shock for the client, which has led to some pretty late nights in seeking to challenge that statement within the contractual time limits, given the unknown surrounding its contents and a refusal on the employer's part to engage. Looking on to timings then, it's important that you know when you're allowed to issue your final account submission under the contract. For example, the JCT final statement starts to run from practical completion being certified. Um, so in the case of the JCT standard build contract, that's six months whereas under the design and build, you're looking at a three month period. Also be aware that a failure to provide the final statement can result in the employer providing its own final statement, providing it has given notice in accordance with the contract beforehand. Um, and as discussed, this is also the case with the NEC. So this is another point or, or, or thing to be aware of. You also need to be aware of when payment notices and payless notices are required in respect of the final statement. Um, and I'm sure we're, Beck will discuss this a little bit further later, but um, if, if the contract is silent on the point of payment notices and payless notices for the final, for any final statement or certificate, then I'd suggest looking towards the scheme for guidance as it's now well established law, thanks to cases such as Grove versus s and um, and M Davenport versus Greer, that payment notices and payless notices are required in respect of a final account, um, that we're not just dealing with interim payments when, when we're looking towards these notices. Finally, you should also be aware of any specific timing provisions under your contract. Um, for example, within the JCT design and build, um, the due date for final payments, um, and in the standard build contract, the date on which the contract administrator must issue a final certificate is dependent on whichever of the following three events occurs last. Um, this being the end of the rectification period, the date of the certificate of making good, and the date on which the final statement is submitted. Now, if you are in a position where the employer refuses to provide a certificate of making good for whatever reason, um, this does not necessarily stop you from issuing a final statement. For example, again, I've been working on a case where the employer has um, somewhat inexplicably refused to issue a certificate despite the, de the defects as notified being remedied. So we therefore adjudicated on this point together with others um, and got a decision that said that the defect certificates should have been provided on a certain date. You could however also rely on the date on which the adjudicator's de decision was provided if he or she does not specify a date but merely decided that the certificate for making good should have been issued. So are there, there are ways to get some certainty on your deadlines if facing a particularly tricky employer and client, and certainly if you are keen to, to get your final statement out the door and get that process underway. So turning now to conclusivity and whether and how these provisions become binding, and more importantly, how we can challenge them. Uh, certain contracts, particularly the JCT, can have some pretty draconian consequences if the final statement or certificate, as the case may be, are not challenged within the period prescribed under the contract. It's therefore important that you check your contract for any express provisions. Um, depending on the wording of the particular contract, a final certificate or statement could become conclusive evidence as to payment, uh, the quality of work executed, uh, latent and patent defects and or a mixture of the above. So this really is something to, to, to watch out for and be aware of right from the very beginning. As to timing, it's also very important to know what your contract says on this 
as there's strict timescales under the JCT for a party to formally challenge a final statement. For example, under the JCT design and build, the latest time you can challenge a final statement is no later than 28 days after the due date. Now, the courts will sometimes exercise some leniency in this regard, as I'll come on to, but this really shouldn't be relied upon. So, if you have a final statement that you don't agree with, what does the challenge entail? Well, typically, it's the case that the party in receipt of a final statement that wishes to challenge it would have to rush around issuing proceedings, be it in the TCC or by way of arbitration, depending on what the contract says, um, while also looking to commence an adjudication. Um, the idea being that you commence the adjudication and any proceedings before the expiry of the relevant deadline, then apply to stay proceedings while awaiting the outcome of the adjudication. Uh, I mean, quite frankly, this is stressful, costly and frantic for, for all involved, as um, Beck and I well know. Um, therefore, the relatively recent case of CC Construction Limited versus Mincioni may come as a relief to some, but I would note this case is specific to the JCT design and build. As to the facts, um, here Mr. Mincioni engaged CCC construction under an amended JCT 2011 design and build contract to build the shell and core of a new house in Knightsbridge. Work started in April 2016, but was delayed such that Mr. Mincioni took partial possession of the works in December 2018 and partial completion for the remainder of the works was achieved in November 2019. So 12 months after practical completion, the rectification period ended and therefore CC Construction sent a final statement to Mr. Mincioni in the sum of around 483,000. Mr. Mincioni disputed the final statement by way of a letter or what became known colloquially as the notice of dispute later that same month. He also served a payment notice denying that any payment was due and that the account had been overpaid by some 250,000. Now, one of the main issues between the parties was whether Mr. Mincioni had validly prevented the final statement and the sum stated as due from becoming conclusive by way of his notice of dispute, or was it a case that he should have also commenced legal proceedings? CC Construction claimed that legal proceedings were required to challenge the final statement. Um, the notice wasn't enough. And on this, they, re they relied on clause 1.8, which off the top of my head, I believe is also clause 1.9 in the uh, standard bill contract. Now, this clause provides two ways for conclusivity and um, the final statement to, to, to not be binding. And um, to avoid this, you can basically commence adjudication, arbitration or other pr proceedings before the due date for final payment. Or in the alternative, you can commence adjudication, arbitration or other proceedings um, within 28 days after the due date. I would note, however, that um, conclusivity is only suspended in respect of matters to which those proceedings specifically relate if you do go for that second option whereas the first option um which you know i understand is actually quite is quite hard to meet you know it's quite it's quite difficult to uh issue adjudication and proceedings certainly in such a, a quick time scale short time scale um but if you do manage to do that then that actually prevents all of the final statement uh becoming conclusive and binding so conversely um, turning back to our case, uh, Mr. Mincioni relied on the notice of dispute, uh, the, the notice of dispute and the terms of clause 4.12.6, which uh, in its unamended form, which is on the slide, states that except to the extent that prior to the due date for the final payment, the employer gives notice to the contractor disputing anything in the final statement and subject to clause 1.82, the final statement shall upon the due date become conclusive as to the sum due. So Mr. Mincioni argued that the above clause meant that he only needed to issue a notice of dispute and that any other proceedings um, as granted under clause 1.8 were optional. Essentially, his argument was that he didn't need to do both. The court agreed with him and said that clause 4.12.6 did not create a two-step obligation, but rather gave the employer two options. The first being to provide the notice, disputing the final uh, dis the final statement, as Mr. Mincioni did, and the second being the option to issue legal proceedings. 
So although the court's interpretation of clause 4.12.6 is certainly encouraging, consideration as to what is required to, to challenge a final statement should be done on a contract by contract and case by case basis, not least because CC construction refers specifically to the JCT design and build contract. Um, for example, the JCT standard building contract doesn't have an equivalent provision to clause 4.12.6, so you will still have to commence your proceedings um, in accordance with clause 1.8. As I touched upon prior, however, and for all the draconian consequences and these very strict timescales, um, while the courts do appear willing to enforce conclusive evidence clauses, case law has suggested that they do sometimes have some sympathy for parties who are subject to a tight 28-day deadline given the amount of work involved in challenging these statements. For example, in the case of University of Brighton uh, versus Dove House Interiors, which concerned an intermediate, um, a JCT intermediate building contract, the parties were unable to reach agreement over the value of the final account. So the contract administrator went ahead and issued the final certificate, which started the 28 day period within which the contractor could commence proceedings to challenge it. The parties agreed between themselves to increase the 28 day period to 66 days to allow themselves longer to negotiate. But on day 65, the contractor served a notice of adjudication in order to protect his position. Unfortunately, um, and as a lawyer, this sort of makes me nervous, but unfortunately that notice was not sent to the address specified in the contract and it named the wrong nominating body. But despite this, and despite the fact that the notice had to be reissued in order for the adjudication to be valid, the court held that the adjudication had been commenced in the time time for the purpose of allowing the contractor the right to challenge the final certificate. Um, I mean, it's a pretty close call on that one. But on the other side of the, the coin, um, in the case of Mark Gilbert Settlement Trust, the court held that a party cannot issue court proceedings and then change its mind and issue adjudication proceedings as the defendant sought to do in this case. Here, the court found that a party cannot issue one set of proceedings within the 28 day period and then subsequently issue a second set of proceedings outside that 28 day period, even where the second set is only raising the same matters as the first. Now, the only exception to this is when initial proceedings are commenced as an adjudication. So ultimately, um, it seems apparent that the courts recognize the draconian consequences of final statement provisions as to conclusivity and are willing to show some leniency and sympathy as the case may be. However, and as we'll come back, I'll come back to when we, we look over housekeeping points, reliance shouldn't be placed on this and the onus is very much to check the contents of your contract and know fully um, what is required of you and when you should receive a final statement. Uh, that's the end of my particular talk on that. I've got another slide on interest, but I think I'm going to hand back to Rebecca now so that she can pick up um, the balance of her slides and then I'll uh, touch upon interest again uh, in a few minutes. Thank you so much, Adele, and thank all of you as well for um, bearing with while we uh, just kind of rehashed everything slightly. If you don't mind, I'll go back to um, just finishing off on payment notices and then we will discuss pay less notices and smash and grab adjudications. Um, if I just take the slides back. Okay, so as a, a quick recap, as we discussed, the payment applications, payment notices and default notices must be served within time, set out the sum due and the basis on which they're calculated, and they absolutely will fail on a technicality. So minute issues with the form or timing will render them invalid. Content, however, is almost entirely irrelevant. So if the values are wildly inflated, for example, so long as the sum due and how it was calculated is clearly shown, the notice will be valid and it will have the potential to become binding. Um, the only way really therefore to attempt to defend this, though it is limited, is to dispute the validity based on one of these technicalities. So bearing that in mind, there are some rules when it comes to notices. Um, as good practice, generally I would recommend to always respond to a notice when it is received, even if it is not contractually required. Um, particularly if you're the contractor and a payment notice sets out a negative figure as the sum due, 
I would immediately challenge the validity of that notice, reattach your previous notice or your previous application and restate what you consider to be the sum due. Um, as Adele has said and I've said previously, check your contract specifically for the notices, the deadlines, the terms that you're required to comply with in response to such an event. Sometimes these can be extremely tight, um, so please do be aware and have your contract very thoroughly memorised, or at least to hand. Um, and always diarise these dates. Uh, it could cost a lot of money. Um, simply missing a deadline and these are absolutely draconian deadlines so don't be late by a day um, have them in your diary set reminders and then meet them in terms of payment applications uh, courts have sometimes accepted that these can be late um, if there is a variation to payment terms by conduct for example payment applications cannot be early if there is a time frame for an application then it needs to be given on or very close to that time. You shouldn't be estimating the value of works you are yet to complete for a, for a payment period. Um, in terms of notices, however, they should always be on time. Do not rely on a variation by conduct argument. They, there's not leeway for them to be late in the same way as applications. Um, I had an issue with a client recently where the um, project payment mechanism in reality in practice was implemented essentially by way of gentlemen's agreement that sat outside of the contractual mechanism. I think this is quite common. It's very easy to understand how it can occur in reality. Um, you're collegial, everyone's getting along until the minute they're not. Um, so I would certainly always recommend from a very pessimistic point of view to not rely on these. Um, as I said, everyone's getting along until they're not. So please always make sure you get your documents in on time even if you have a meeting scheduled to discuss them the next week or some other agreement with the other party, it's always best just to comply with those deadlines. In terms of pay less notices, by default, the paying party must make payment by the final date for payment. If they wish to withhold any portion of the notified sum or the notified sum in its entirety, then they must issue a pay less notice within the relevant deadline. If they do not do so, then it could be taken that the party has agreed to the sum notify as actually being due, which was in ISG construction. Um, that was, however, until Grove, which we will come to shortly. Uh, if the paying party fails to issue a valid pay less notice and does not make payment by the final date for payment, then the contractor or the unpaid party can give notice of its intention to a either suspend performance of all or any of its obligations under the contract. This is uh, in section 112 of the Construction Act or refer a dispute to adjudication, which is colloquially known as the smash and grab adjudication or do both. Um, the right to suspend under section 112 is a statutory right. It exists outside of the contract and regardless of whether such a right is provided for in the construction contract. Um, it requires notice of intention to execute. It must be given in writing at least seven days in advance of the suspension occurring. So please don't immediately suspend or even reduce your resources on site following a default payment. It could be a repudiatory breach of contract. Um, the paying party can, however, avoid the need to pay the notified sum if it issues a valid pay less notice as said. The pay less notice, as with all of the other notices, should set out the sum the paying party considers due and the basis on which it's calculated. Uh, within the scheme, this is to be issued seven days before the final date of payment, though contractual mechanisms can allocate any time frame it would like. Um, standard form ones are all different, so please check your contract thoroughly to see what applies. Um, in terms of pay less notices in Grove, Colson J confirmed that the basis of the sum due can actually be incorporated by reference. So in Grove, the um, paying party created a pay less notice and within it referred to its previous payment notice in terms of the calculation of the sum due rather than recreating it. Um, even though the payment notice itself was invalid, Coulson, re Coulson decided that they could rely still on the calculations set out therein in its pay less notice just by reference. I would recommend just to be safe to simply recreate these calculations as opposed to attempt to incorporate them by reference, but at least you know you can if you need to, absolutely need to. Um, so in terms of 
the right to suspend, which we've discussed. There's also the smash and grab adjudications, which is set out above. An unpaid party has the right to refer a dispute to adjudication if the notified sum is not paid on the final date for payment. These are reviewed to technicalities, or limited to technicalities only. So it's a review of the validity of the original notice or application and the payment dates. So if the notice is valid and a date has been missed, then the notified sum must be paid. So it's a very fast, cheap means of recovering a sum due. It's a pay first, ask questions later style approach. And there's no valuation or assessment of the works or any claims that might be at play. Um, in Grove, it was held that a paying party is entitled to start a true value adjudication to determine the value of any interim application or notice only as long as the notified sum has already been paid. So as discussed, it's a pay first, ask questions later style approach. Um, in particular, the Court of Appeal noted that while Section 111 of the Construction Act does create an immediate payment obligation that can be enforced by way of adjudication, it is not the philosopher's stone, they say. It does not transmute the sum notified into a true valuation of the work done. So naturally, this decision confirms that there is an immediate payment obligation created by Section 111, and it does limit, actually, the existing principle that there is a right to refer a dispute to adjudication at any time, as in this case, if a paying party disagrees with the unpaid party's notified sum, it cannot refer this to adjudication until the notified sum has been paid. Um, this was tempered slightly by the TCC in, um, in Davenport and Greers, where it was said that such an adjudication could be commenced, however its decision could not be enforced until the notified sum had been paid. So in terms of an immediate payment obligation, when does this arise? So much like the old adage, if a tree falls in the wood and there is no one to hear, it doesn't make a sound, we naturally have our own similarly philosophical conundrum when it comes to payment obligations. So if a final payment date has been missed and therefore section 111 has been triggered, but there is no smash and grab decision, does the payer need to pay? Um, the answer is really don't know. It, it is arguable that the immediate obligation has not truly arisen until the smash and grab award has been obtained. And so a true value adjudication could arguably be commenced immediately in circumstances where the validity of the application or notice is disputed or there is some other procedural irregularity. Uh, we recommend that if you are defending a smash and grab adjudication on one of these bases then you should commence a true value adjudication as soon as possible after the smash and grab adjudication has commenced just so that you minimise the time between the decisions and therefore the time that you're out of pocket as much as possible. Um, Ideally, if you're aware that you have missed a date for payment, you did not have a valid pay less notice, and you know that the other party is looking to pursue a smash and grab adjudication, it could be worth commencing a true value adjudication without waiting for the smash and grab adjudication to commence. Um, we did this recently with a client which resulted in the two proceedings running almost parallel with a view to getting the true value decision before the smash and grab decision, which at least provides the potential for a set off rather than a full payment by the paying party, followed by either an adjustment through a subsequent true value adjudication or even by way of the next interim valuation. However, there is no question that where a smash and grab award has been made, that will need to be paid before a true value adjudication can then commence. So therefore, there are a number of ways that these required default payments can either imminently be recouped, either by way of a parallel true value adjudication, or by way of a more realistic valuation and payment notice in the next interim payment cycle, if, if you can wait that long. Um, when it comes to the unpaid party, our recommendation is to, as we've said, diarise those dates as soon as a date for payment is missed, get that smash and grab adjudication started and try to get the money in your pocket. Um, in terms of pr further practicalities when it comes to interest and housekeeping, I'll, I'll turn back to Adele. Thanks, Mark. Right, one point that I did want to bring up 
uh, in this talk. Just um, as a final point, because I appreciate we are running out of, bit of time, but because it comes up quite a bit, um, is interest on payments. Now, essentially, the interest you have to pay under a construction contract will be dictated by that contract's provisions. Um, which will ideally define the interest rate and when interest applies and that it's payable as a debt. Unfortunately, if the contract is silent on that issue, there's no implied right to interest at common law. So your next point of call would be the late payment of Commercial Debt Interest Act 1998, under which the interest, uh, the interest rate for late payment uh, is simple interest at a fixed rate and um, that rate is set twice a year by adding 8% to the Bank of England's official dealing rate. Unfortunately, the Late Payment Act is not a catch-all safety net, um, but it does have the potential to catch all or part of a construction contract as defined by the Construction Act. Now, I say this as the Late Payment Act covers the supply of goods, including sell, hire, purchase, lease and loan, um, of goods, services, including per professional, um, manual, commercial, agency, and uh, outsourcing. Contracts likely to fall outside of the Act, however, would include um, assignment, novation, termination of an existing contract, even when that initial contract would fall under the Act. Um, it would also um, discount share sales, loans and guarantees, sales of land, leases, um, and settlements of disputes not relating to supply of goods and services. Um, on top of that, you also have to demonstrate that you actually have what's known as a qualifying debt. That is a debt created by virtue of an obligation under the contract um, and where there is an obligation to pay the whole or part of the contract price. Of course, parties to um, construction contracts or commercial contracts can exclude the right to interest under the Late Payment Act. Um, but to do that, the contract does have to provide an alternative substantial contractual remedy for late payments. Um, so an express interest clause within a contract can therefore displace interest under the Act, but only if it provides a substantial remedy. Um, a clause that fails to do so is void, and then in that case, we turn back to the Act. Um, so that was just a very quick um, reminder um, as to, to what your rights are, what your entitlement is. Um, in regards to um, interest. So tying everything together, um, and hopefully this should be sort of quite obvious by now, given um, some of the general themes that Beck and I have been um, harking on about for the last uh, 50 minutes or so, but um, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, in terms of payments, certainly final statements, whatever stage you're at, record keeping is absolutely key. Um, you know, you want to be able to back up your figures, you want to substantiate them. It will, it's a pain, I know, at the time, but trust me, when you have to dispute these things, you're going to end up with the lawyers asking you, where, where are these, uh, where are these documents? Um, make sure that you note your notice and account requirements under the, uh, the contract. Um, know your deadlines, as Bex said a few times now, diarise those deadlines and don't leave it to the last minute. Know your service options and requirements. Make sure that you're serving these notices correctly with the uh, well, notices when you need them correctly with the uh, correct content, that they're going to the right people, the right place, by the right means. Um, please don't sit on final statements. As soon as you get a final statement that you're unhappy with, um, start taking action. Um, either get some advice or start getting sent, at least send out your notices um, to, to, to begin challenging that. And then also when drafting, consider whether conclusive and binding provisions can be removed. So I'd like to say thank you for, for listening to us. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll open the floor to Jeremy if there's any questions. Hello. Um, brilliant. Um, thank you both very much. That was very thorough. Um, payment and this type of issue is always quite a tricky one because you have to sort of set out in detail and detail. But what was what I really appreciate was all the little practical hints um, and tips that were, were dotted dotted around. Um, and I think it's just worth emphasising something that you both were very, very clear on. Um, and talking about the courts are sometimes sympathetic to you. If you miss a date, you miss a deadline, you don't do something right. 
And that's right. But what happens more often than not is you see a court says, well, I'm very sympathetic with the contract, very sympathetic with the employer, but. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the one thing that's been come out was crystal clear from what you both said is, you know, and it's and that's boring and dull and lawyers always say, read your contract, follow the terms precisely. But with this particular issue, um, it's so, so important. Um, in terms of questions, I think these little switch in order that we had might have saved you from the questions because we had two or three questions in relation to um, true value adjudications that I was going to ask you. Um, but Be um, Rebecca sort of detailed the various possibilities about just five minutes ago. So I think that should be clear in everyone's mind. And we just had a quick question about interest rates for the late payment, whether 3% would be um, a fair rate. And I think the answer to that is, I don't know, the terrible lawyer's answer is it depends on the circumstances. Although the, there's a specific rate that's put in the uh, the late payment act, if you can justify why that is a fair and proper remedy, then of course that will be um, that will be allowed. The onus is on you. I and mean, I think, yeah. Del. I yeah. think, I think, yeah, definitely. It, it's um, the question there, and as you said, it is a case of it's very much dependent on the facts um, and looking towards, say, the bargaining position of the parties. You know how that was negotiated, what the understanding was behind that, as to demonstrating that it is a substantial remedy, certainly. Okay, well, that's brilliant, and I know that time is time is pressing. So thank you again, both, very much. Um, and it's just time to let people know details of our next um, uh, uh, webinar. Following a theme, um, uh, George Body, one another senior associate at Fanny Kelly, will be joined by Daniel Churchill, barrister at Four Pump Court, for our first adjudication update of 2022. So that's um, 12 noon on um, Thursday, the 24th of February. So hopefully we will see you all there. So thank you all very much for attending, and thank you again, Adele and Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you.